<laughs> What's going on, YouTube? Welcome, to welcome to Wheel Zero. <laughs> we're back. <laughs> I know you've been waiting. We're back. Destroy, <laughs> subscribe. <laughs> no, hey guys, what's going on? Um, I'll keep this one simple. A little preamble. This is not going to be a show where I do much because I'm the least experienced out of the four here. Um, we were talking about comfort, and for a lot of guys, their problem isn't that they're starting from zero. They're not sitting in their mom's basement eating Cheetos, but they do have a certain level of comfort in their life that makes it very hard to strive for something better. Like Rich always says, chase excellence. And everybody else here has their own they version have of that. Certain... No! Chase oh. excellence. And everybody, everybody else. Sorry. sorry that's, 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 fine. That's, fine. that's fine. Yeah. yeah so, so I figured, I figured at, this point, at this point, we've been dealing, dealing a lot with what's wrong with salmon. We've been dealing, been dealing wrong with what's wrong with, what's wrong with unattractive guys. Guys. Now let's get some crazy feedback right now. Crazy feedback. I'm not sure who that is. Maybe it's. Testing. It's all it's all John's fault. It must have came in when John, John came in. It's fixed now. It's fixed <sighs> now. We got it. Okay, good to go. So then, why not? Okay, so you've read Rational Mail. You've joined Entrepreneurs and Cars, the private community. You've read all of Troy's books, which I'm impressed by the way. It's a lot of books. You're in Body Language Mastery. You've been following me on Patreon, and you've gotten a couple lays under your belt. You're earning a little bit, and now you're comfortable. What do you do now that you don't have that fire under your ass, that threat of pain? being too comfortable. I figured Rich, great example of this one. Because you're, I would say, arguably the most successful one out of the group here. So how did you go from normally comfortable and successful to hyper successful? Well, I think Rolo is probably the most successful. So why don't we pass the Ooh. crown over to him? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. I don't know how. <laughs> I'll put me on the part right away. You know? um, well, uh, I'm older than all of you. <laughs> no, I am. Um, it, it's, I don't know. I hate to, I hate to get all like esoteric on this, but it's like, you know, how do you define success, right? Is it, all, is it financial success? Is it like your dent in the universe kind of success? And that's why I, I, when I'm, when I'm talking or when people like compare like my life to what it is that they're doing and they'll say, Oh, you got it. All, you got it so easy because you are from a different generation or you, you learn this stuff along the way. And now we're still, you know, like we're still having to figure this stuff out. And I, I always say, you know, don't use my life as sort of like proof of like what you can do with your life it's on you you have to be building things for yourself but that said um i mean i've done i've always been sort of a creative individual so uh, i've had that talent um that i use in a lot of different ways so i started out uh just by sort of being a commercial artist back in like say the gosh the <clears throat> movies, i think and then i got into um I got into layout uh, and I, I actually was on the cusp of where like desktop publishing got into from like old school, like actually doing manual stuff to um, to getting to like uh, Quark Express and Photoshop. I've been using photo like if when you see the the thumbnails for this show and my show and everything else, that's that's the result of probably about almost like 30 years <laughs> of, uh, of of my experience in Photoshop. So I've been doing it for quite some time. I, I started with like version like 2.5 or 3.0 <laughs> and I found that I could use that uh, to make some money. And that's that was my first sort of like step away from from Rockstar Rolo to like I can actually do something else and make some money, and I don't have to live in a single bedroom apartment in North Hollywood and have a spool for a breakfast table, <laughs> you know. So um, so I started doing that, and then I got into uh, from there. I decided to finally go and get it get my education, you know, solidified. I don't. I, the one thing I think that uh, a lot of people don't really I don't think they really realize is that education is sort of a reward in itself. Cause I think a lot of people go to school to get a better job. Like the whole point of they're going to like, if you, if that's your point, go to trade school, don't go to college, go to go learn welding or, or electrician or go, go learn something. That's like a, a skill or a trade. Don't go to college. But if you want to be a, if you're like, I want to learn lots of things about a lot of things, right. Then pay attention, do well in school and learn stuff there. And yes, you're going to have to deal with, you know, this liberal academia. I got it. But go in armed, right? And then, you know, I'm just like, I, I, I didn't set out to do what I do, but uh, I, it just sort of rolled into what it, what I've become. So I, I don't know. I, I've been in the liquor industry. I've been in the gaming industry. I've been in um, 
I've actually uh, helped design um, like video gambling machines. I won't tell you for whom, but uh, one of the largest companies in the world that did that uh, brand identity. I still do freelance work right now. I still do promotional stuff for my old uh, brands. I have a stay an ownership stake in two mm -hmm. brands of liquor right now, and uh, and then I do this. Once I hit fifty, I said, you know what? I want to do. I want to be a writer. I want to do what I'm doing. So I sort of split yeah. my time between the two. So a lot of it for you yeah. is just iterative. Every day was better than the day well, before. I, I think what's funny is like a lot of people go. Like a lot of guys, particularly guys today in this Lost Boys generation, they they go. I don't know what to do with myself. I don't have a purpose, right? I I I point this out actually in book four. Um, where like Jordan Peterson's talking about how like, you know we have this lost boys generation and they're they they're searching for meaning they're not searching for meaning they're searching for purpose because they're men they're they're interested in things they don't know what to do with themselves that's why you see all of these guys who are just sort of not doing anything getting comfortable at home getting comfortable with you know just with life in general and not doing anything to really improve themselves or become better versions of themselves and they're okay with that while women are out be you know what are they I, I was talking to the uh, about this with Hotep Jesus last night. And it was like, was it 65% of college graduates right now? And it's gonna go up higher than that. 65% of college graduates are women right now. Uh, something like 50 some odd percent of masters and doctorates degrees are going to women right now. And yes, it's a it's a diploma mill, yes, academia, yes, it's a racket right now, but still women are out there and it seems to me that they have all of this advantage to become something else or to, to like, to go forward and do something with themselves and whether they're doing that because of genuine interest, I don't know, but I can say that a lot of guys simply don't know what to do with themselves right now. They have no, they have no clue what, what to do. And so there's a sort of this generation of purposeless guys. And to those guys, I would say this is just go and do something like, like if something's interesting into you, start a business, do you do your art, do whatever is interesting yeah. to you. And that will well, happen. That's like, that's like example. Cause, cause you kind of did that, didn't you? Well, yeah, because that way you start to get momentum. So if you just start like Rollo says, just start doing something, then even if you, it turns out that you don't actually like that thing, it's probably going to suggest something else to you. And then you can go on and divert into that thing instead but for me the whole comfort issue i mean you you get it typically with jobs and you get it in relationships as well i was in a job for a long time where we used to talk about golden handcuffs you know which was that it was quite well paid you know i was earning some decent money in london i have you know my own apartment i bought a second property and all this kind of thing and you know i was doing i was doing pretty well and and there was a good progression path there as well but the thing was that or most of us, when you when you got down to it, most of us who worked in that organization and within that industry didn't actually like what we were doing. And you'd have conversations with guys at the bar, you know, late at night when they'd had a few drinks and they'd be sort of saying, no, I hate it, but I've got to do it because, you know, um, a lot of these guys have families to look after and that, and that kind of thing. So that locked them in. But more, more than that, it's sort of like, well, if I give this up, then what am I going to do then? And for me, um, I was always just looking at a way to break out of that because I was very aware that, um, yes, it was comfortable, but at the same time, I needed for my soul, you know, to get out of that situation that I, that I was in. And then it was a sort of a chain of events, really. I was quite lucky in some ways because there was a lot of um, disruption in the industry. I kind of got pushed out of one company. Then I went somewhere else. And that was a, a disaster for various reasons. And I, I just started to realize this thing that I've been doing for all these years, it's just not working anymore. And at, at that point, because I've been working on writing in the background, I've been writing all these articles for Return of Kings and I was getting some you know, good feedback from that. And I uh, was selling this book that was starting to make some quite good revenue per month. You know, at that point, it just becomes like, well, do I do I stick or do I jump? And I just thought, sorry, I'm just going to jump and I'm going to go into that, you know, the, the discomfort of not really knowing if this is going to work or not. Um, and I'm Dude, really you can't that boil that frog. That's awesome. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so at some point, you've just got to make the jump. You know, you've just got to think, sod it. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do it. Yeah, well, I mean, same, that's with what... relationships. same with relationships as well. I'll finish here, but like people are in comfortable relationships as well. Exactly the same thing, you know, mm -hmm. and you yeah. see this all the time. Well, then, Rich, because, yeah, you're the same thing. Like you were comfortable and you did well, but you wanted to be better than well. But for you, was there wasn't really a giant like event, a trauma event, like a guy. Getting no, there was, out, was there. Oh, there was. No, no, no. Well, I kind of did get zeroed, actually. You know, if you want to apply that definition, because um I worked for uh, North America's largest collection agency at the time, and I was a branch manager. I think we were doing close to $3 million a year in um, sales receipts. We had a 
I mean, I had a really good team, a team that was highly productive and very profitable. But the, but the problem with it was um, you get hired for your resume and you get fired for fit. And about eight months before I got packaged off, um, they transferred over this uh, abrasive, rough French Canadian guy. Um, I'll never forget his stories. Like this guy would tell us stories about how his dad shot his face off and you know, he grew up fatherless because of it and got into alcohol. And like, he had all of these stories about what a rough life, life he had. And he was this heavy ass smoker. Like he's one of these guys where you could smell smoke on him and the smoker's voice, like first thing in the morning, even just going up in the elevator. Um, so anyway, like me and him would butt heads cause he would, because he would get me to go and run these stupid reports that he would never look at. And after a while I just got fed up. And I remember this one time he just started, um, basically just demeaning me in front of two other managers and I lost my shit Ooh. on him. I'm like, I'm going to throw you and your desk out the window. And after that point, this is about four months before I got packaged up. And after that point for about four months, everybody called me the office defenestrator because apparently defenestration is throwing somebody out of a window. So, um, <laughs> I, got, I got, you know, I got zeroed out after that because when, because when the, uh, head office down in the States, which was partly owned by an Indian company at the time, and they were starting to outsource a lot of call center work, um, you know, they said, well, you need to cut the head count and management head count was on average making about six figures. Like I think the last year that I worked there in the 11 months, I did about 120,000 or something like that. Um, so I was getting paid fairly well, and they called me down um, to the seventh floor, which was the um, executive offices at the time in that building, and that was never a good thing when they really called you on the seventh floor. So I go down, and the HR manager's at a table with uh, my VP and the um, office lawyer, and I'm like, all right, something's up here. And they slide over an envelope across the table with a package for me, which was, um, I can't remember what it was. It was under 20 grand, like something like 15 to 20 grand at the time. It was peanuts. Um, and I just, I just looked at it, look at it. Then I looked at them and I took it and I went home. I'm like, all right, fine. I'll sign this. I'll take it. Cause I'm fed up. Like I hated my boss. I hated the business. There was nothing that I really loved about it. And probably for the, like at least three years prior to that, I kept it like a running journal of all these business ideas that I had. Like, I just knew that I wasn't going to go back and work for somebody else. My phone started ringing, started talking to a few other companies that wanted to recruit me. And it, like, it just started feeling like the same gig you know, same shit, different place. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started up my um, uh, debt business. Actually, it was about a month or two after that. I didn't work for about a month or two. And I was doing my taxes with my accountant. And he said to me, um, you know, I did a video on this actually about a month ago on how I got to my first million. Um, now, what's the title of the video? Uh, title of the video is something like um, how I grew my business to $290,000 a month in uh, sales. So you can go back and check that out to watch it. But basically, the guy said, you know, I've got this guy that's got loads of credit card debt. I'm trying to do mortgage financing. What do I do to make it fit? It doesn't work. And I just looked at it. I said, you know, I can just settle the debt. So he said, good, go do it and charge a fee. So I did. And then I just built the business after that. Now, I'd always worked for myself prior to my 20s. So basically from 21 to, to about 29, 30, I did what every good beta is told to do that's plugged into societal conditioning and lies, which is just get a job. Make sure you have a good, secure salary, you know, salary man, right? You know, they call it salary man over in mm -hmm. Japan. I was watching this documentary the other day on Japan with James May on Amazon Prime. But um, yeah, so I just became the salary man, right? And it wasn't, it wasn't a bad thing. It, it paid well. And I learned a lot about corporate environment and HR and hiring procedures and selling techniques. And like, I learned a lot. But at the end of the day, I, I was always... <laughs> at the core, somebody that needed to work for themselves. Like I had a paper route when I was like nine and I would contract out part of the route to friends. I had a business <laughs> returning bottles. Oh yeah. yeah. I had a uh, business contract returning bottles and, uh, you know, beer bottles and liquor bottles to the liquor store. Cause they paid about 10 cents a bottle at the time. And I used to collect those and return that and make money. So I was always doing something from the age of nine or 10. Cause whenever I asked my parents for money, they'd basically say, no, go out and do something to earn money. So I cut grass, shovel driveways, return bottles. I had a paper route. I had my first job when I was like 13 or 14, um, you know, working at white rose in a fucking greenhouse. That was, that was brutal, man. You want to, you want a hard job working a greenhouse in the summertime. Um, you know, so I did a lot of stuff, but I was always running something on my own. I, I had a, a mobile car detailing business when I was 15, 16, you know, with a friend of mine. Um, but, 
by about 30, I just went all in, man. Like I went balls deep and I just knew that I'd seen enough guys do well at it that weren't any smarter than I was. And I just, I just doubled down and I went hardcore on it. And you know, you just have to do the work, man. You want to get there. You got to do the damn work. It's as simple as that. Dude. I love that. And John, I'm going to pass this off to you. Cause yours is awesome. You literally like, said like you know everybody gives the platitudes about burning the ships behind you so there's no going back you actually did that so you're not just saying it as a platitude well like, i don't know if people I, know about johnny's one i guess yours too you just like yeah well you guys when you tell your vp that you're gonna throw him out the window with his desk you're pretty much guaranteed <laughs> to get a package at some point <laughs> fair point, fair point. <laughs> i mean like this was a big company like we're talking 800 staff you know the ceo is probably making well over a million dollars like it was yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right johnny i love i always love hearing your story because you basically just uprooted not only to like a different place to live but a different culture a different language a different everything yeah well i mean i'm a big fan of just you know going all in and uh when you go all in you either you win big or you lose big but when you lose big you also learn big and like, I don't know. I mean, I'm just so used to not being comfortable that like being comfortable is actually uncomfortable for me. Like I'm always trying to do something new. Like this is just who I am. I'm always like in the gym. I'm always at jujitsu or Muay Thai. I'm always, you know, working hard on my YouTube channel. Um, I just think a lot of guys, uh, it's, it's so easy to pay $8 and watch Netflix and smoke weed and jerk off and watch porn. And just instead of like going to the gym, instead of cooking food, instead of going to pick up chicks, you know, the taking the, the short and easy route. Yeah. It's like, it's instantly gratifying, but it's a long term, uh, devastation, man. Because the thing is when you suffer and you're trying to do something new in life, this forces you to think of new ways to solve your problem, which in, you know, in the end of the day teaches you to like learn new skills that you didn't have before. And therefore that makes you more valuable man. And the more valuable you are, the more you're going to get out of life, whether it be with women or in the free marketplace with the economy, you know, money and all those things. So if you're not challenging yourself to grow, by default of life, we're just naturally decaying things. Um, our mentality is decaying. You know, if you don't stay sharp mentally, you don't stay sharp physically, you're going to be regressing. Like <clears throat> men and humans in general, we're like the stock market. We're never going to the side. We're either going up or we're going down. And by default, you're going down. So if you're not like working hard to make yourself better. I mean, what are you doing? Like, this is why your life sucks. If you're having like a problem in your life. Yeah. Well, dude, that's funny. Cause you know, Rich was talking, how you had your journal and all the books you did. I kind of did that too. So like my last four years in the military, I was kind of done with it. I was giving it a last chance. I started a degree on the government's dime right then. So by the time that fourth year came, I had enough options to leave. So I was my version of a book and I went off and left and did corporate kind of came into the same situations as you except for i didn't threaten to throw anybody out of a window but that's only because you're much bigger than me i'd have a hard time getting the leverage <laughs> but it, and i think it, and i really do owe you a thank you for that part of it the business side of things because you kept telling me it's like why don't you just do it and i'm like ah, why don't i just do it and it was literally just a layoff random layoff nothing to do with me stock prices tanked so they cut the fat and i was one of the new guys so they got rid of me and I'm like, well, it was either I start this or I start something else. So for me, it was literally staving off boredom and trying something new. But at least you tried something though, because you had that inciting incident. You had the layoff, but you yeah. could have you could have said, Oh, sorry, I'm just gonna I'm gonna go all out, I'm just gonna find another corporate gig. But you didn't. You actually chose to make the, the leap. So that is that's yeah. to your um that's to your credit because and this is the thing, right? Sometimes these things do come up in life. These these issues, you know, you 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 get dumped, you get fired, something happens. And it's it, how are you gonna handle that? Are you just gonna go back to, to the same right. comfort or to something similar? Or are you gonna say, Well, sorry, this is almost like a message from the universe. I'm just gonna go all out now on something that I actually really want to do. Yeah. So 
how you handle it's important as well. It's one of the reasons I wrote Zeroed Out, um, which actually is in no book yet, which is surprisingly <laughs> enough, but Zeroed Out was like a really, a really heavy uh, uh, essay for me um, because I saw a lot of, like, I was dealing with guys who I was counseling who were getting zeroed out and I was noticing sort of these trends in like male suicide which was something that I have had to deal with at least twice in my life right now. And probably, hopefully I never have to again, but, um, but it, it woke me up to like how many times a guy gets zeroed out in his life. So it's easier to deal with being zeroed out when you're like, say 23 or maybe 33, but when you're like 63 or maybe you're like 45, that's when guys go all this shit that I put together, all this stuff that I've built has is now the, the carpet's been pulled out from under me and now I don't know what to do with myself. And do I have time to actually rebuild myself up to where I was before or become something better or something new as a result of this? And it's not just about like losing your wife, right? It could be losing a job. It could be losing a family member. It could be whatever it is. It could be some sort of crisis in your life where you just, all the stuff that you thought was so damn important just disappears overnight and so now you have to start from zero it's like all oh, being zeroed out so that right there i think particularly for guys because guys have a burden of performance at some point in their life they think okay i'm doing everything i'm supposed to be doing i'm i'm building a family i've got a good wife i've got two kids i've got a good job and then something happens and it's this cascade effect right maybe they lose their job and then their wife leaves them and then their wife says oh he was abusing me and and wants some money out of the guy and now suddenly he's gone from being this doing what he was supposed to do right doing the right thing to being like nothing and so what happens is when you are at certain ages, you go, okay, I got plenty of time, right? I'm, tw I'm 25, no problem. I can be zeroed out. I'll start over again. But when you're like 60 or 65 or, or 55, you want to know why the, the demographic of suicide for men is between like 45 and like 60, 65, some, somewhere around there. So that's it's when Karen leaves and takes the kids. Right? When she takes the kids, right? And those guys get zeroed out and they're looking at it. They go, okay, I have two choices. I can rebuild myself from zero or I can put a gun in my mouth. And unfortunately, guys put a gun in their mouth or else they get addicted on, you know, to opiates or because that's the same demographic. Right. Or they become alcoholics or they kill themselves, the kids and the family, because that seems like a better option than having to start all over from scratch again when they maybe have an extra 30 years in their life. Yeah, but that's as, as, another thing is it's kind of an identity. Like you listen to Rich's story, you listen to Troy's story, to John's story, to your story. Like Rich never said, I was Mr. Corporate. I lived for that job. I ate and breathed it. When you talk about the company, I say we. Like mm -hmm. it's a person and it's a good friend of mine. Like none of you guys had any of that. It was no. just kind of, this is something you did. And mm -hmm. then when something you did was no longer working for you, and if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, this being the common thread. It wasn't working for you. So once it started to become untenable or caused a trauma, even if it's a small one, like a layoff or want to throw a guy out of a window or in Troy's cases, like a merger causing some issues, or John's case in that I don't speak Japanese. <laughs> like you do something about it because, you, but I can picture that 65 year old guy who's been doing that same job for 30 years, that job is probably part of his identity. Well, Even I never bought into the whole idea of corporate work as being something to be your identity. Do you know what I mean? Like a lot I, of people I never, do though. A lot of people yeah, make it like yeah. part of them. It's like part of their DNA. I did. Yeah. I never I never drank the Kool-Aid on that. You know, all the way through I was doing it. I just thought this is this is kind of shit, but you know, I'm yeah. I'm making the money or, or whatever. But I know I saw people I saw people around me who who did like you said, who did seem to have drunk the Kool-Aid, who were uh, like really pumped up on it. Like I love my job. This is just my you know and and I was always wondering are those people putting it on or are they serious but maybe they're serious you know um, they probably are serious i, I remember you like yeah. one one thing at my last i used to be uh, in the recruitment business for the medical device industry and if you made a hundred thousand dollars in quarterly sales you got about 10 to 15 percent of it and then you got to call you got to something get to go something called gold club when you got <laughs> You got to go to um, lunch at like the Mandarin <laughs> Oriental or the Ritz Carlton or something like that. And I just like, at first I bought the Kool-Aid. I, I was sipping the Kool-Aid like, yeah, I want to get into Gold Club. But not for like going to have lunch, but going for just the, the achievement, right? I mean, I love mm. just achieving things. It's like a status and, flex. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, th there's like that competitive sales vibe in the air. And... um. I just remember so many people were like, yeah, man, we get to go 
we get to go to lunch in this really nice restaurant. I'm like, yeah, but you can take like 200, 300 bucks and just go have lunch there any day of the week. Like, it's really not that big of a deal. And I'm making this company a hundred grand and they're going to cut me a check for 15,000 and then pay me that money out in three, four months down Mm -hmm. the road. So I wised up real quick to it. I was like, I was number one in the month of December in 2017. Um, I pulled in seventy grand in one month. They're like, "Congratulations, we're gonna give you sixty five hundred bucks in <laughs> in three months." And I was like, "You know, I'm fucking street smart." So I was like, "Damn, this is a shitty ass deal." And that's when I quit and I fucking made my my business. And you know, now I'm I'm doing pretty well. I'm working for myself. I'm fucking super happy. But you know, a lot of people when I told them, they're like, "Yeah, so so what are you gonna do?" I'm like, "I'm gonna quit this job," which is like, you know, this co- this company I worked for. They're recruit holdings. They're they're the official sponsor of the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Nice. And you know, it's not like I was quitting a job at like Home Depot, but like you know, <laughs> I quit this job, and they're like, "What are you gonna do?" I'm like, "I'm gonna become a YouTuber." And they're like, "Okay, what are you really gonna do?" You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Had you been the, doing the modern life dating stuff before you quit, or was it just from yeah. scratch? No, no, I, I have done it. I've been doing it since 2015. Mm. And, like, everybody thinks, like, you know, oh, this guy, MLD, just blew up overnight. Like, nobody was watching my awful videos in 2015 summer in July when I came out. And so, um, but, yeah, it was years. Nick Krauser was giving you grief back in 2015. Yeah, yeah. Nick Krauser. Yeah, he wrote a, I, I, I baited Nick him. Nick Krauser gives writing. everyone grief. Yeah. Nick Krauser, I, I baited him into, into writing a, a piece about me. Um, but that's, like, you know, I, um, I it was uncomfortable to make video after video after video they only get 25 views and i did it for like three four years and then but i learned that hey you know what i really quite frankly i hate making youtube videos and i hate editing and i hate doing all that stuff but i love live streaming so Mm -hmm. the live streaming started picking up in popularity in like you know 2018 ish and so january 21st 2019 i said i'm gonna do a live stream every single day for as many days as I can. And like now, you know, I've helped out over 650 people in body language mastery alone. And like, if you want to just go off as subscribers and people who book consultations and stuff, like I've literally helped thousands of men. But like, even right now, it's it's 1 a.m. And quite honestly, I had a long day and I'm fucking exhausted. And I and don't want to do that flak jacket this. has to be heavy. This thing is like 500 pounds. It's, it's, it's one Socrates. And, um, you know, so, but yeah, like, but it's uncomfortable. And quite honestly, I'd rather just go lay down. I want to watch blood sport. And, uh, but I got to like do this show. And then after this, I got to do dude party because it's part of my grind. It's part of who I am. And it's part of why mm-hmm. I am an above average man. It's why I can go to sleep when I want to sleep and wake up when I want to wake up. I'm not super rich, like, you know, Richard. But like I'm, I'm well enough off that I can do whatever the fuck I want and not really worry about it. And it came through like years of grinding and figuring this shit out, and and quite honestly, not being comfortable doing it. Well, that's yeah. another that's another definition. That's a more subtle definition of comfort, isn't it? What John's talking about. That is like, so it's not just saying I'm not going to have the comfort of a relationship or a, or a stable job. It's actually saying I will undergo discomfort in my everyday life in order to make this happen. So I won't sleep as much as I wanted to. I'll maybe get up early than I want to. You know, I'll work um, when other people are out at the bar. You know, I'll do all of this stuff and I'll actually suffer discomfort in order to achieve that greater goal. And sometimes you need to do that, you know? And this is another thing about doing the work, isn't it? A lot of the time people, they want the results, but they don't want to put in the grind. Yeah, and I will add to this too. There's that manufactured discomfort, and then there's actual discomfort. Well, like cold showers and- uh, Yeah, exactly. The cold showers, the I only drink black coffee with no sweetness meme. Yeah, Like John's discomfort and Rich's discomfort and Rolo's and yours and mine, it was all because like a means to an end. I yeah. slept less today because I got to do some more hours for this work. And this is a revenue generating activity or in Rich's case, like I walked out with a, and you probably, I'm guessing with that $20,000 uh-huh. severance, you probably could have fought and got a little bit more, but for you, <clears throat> that wasn't a fight you wanted to pick. Cause you saw yeah. a better use of your time elsewhere. Am I right? Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have yeah. To- so it's like, you got to pick the proper discomfort and it's almost by ignoring the discomfort. If, if I got it right, it's about, picture where your end state is in my case it's having a business makes as much as i earned when i was working corporate side so not quite 120 but i was pretty close to there anyway 
So getting it to there is a goal. So any discomfort between now and then is in means of that goal, not just, um, well, a ninja took a cold shower and had his ninja course with a cigar. So I might as well do that too. See, and, and jab at Ivan there. <laughs> and that's kind of interesting because now that everybody's uh, shared their story, like uh, Troy, you quit. You didn't really have any other source of income. John, yeah. Ryan, you got a package. I took a package before I started up my own thing. Um, a lot of guys ask about side hustles and running a business on the side as they, you know, kind of go about it and try to get something off the ground. And when I took the package and when I went home, I was three weeks into my first home, right? So I had a mortgage to pay. Um, I didn't have a lot of money saved up. I probably had about six or seven months of worth of runway saved up, uh, you know, for living expenses. Um, you're pretty, like, you're motivated as fuck to make stuff happen. You know, in a position like that, you have, like, you have to make it happen. Um, nothing will get you going like that, if you know what I'm saying. Oh, 100%. And I think that's a good answer to the Codaholics. Thank you for the $20 super chat. He's like, at what net cash flow would you guys say somebody is rich? <clears throat> Honestly, like we can say what makes you rich by the demographics. I would just say once your mortgage is paid, your bills are paid, like all the things you have to do to live are paid for. <clears throat> and then if you want to get something, you don't have to calculate how much it costs in your head. Once you're at that point, I would say rich. For me, point- I just say for me, I just say rich is like you know, being able to be free. I don't, I don't mm. work hard. Cause like, I want money. I need money. Like I'm pretty simple guy. Like, yeah. uh, you know, today I had some pancakes that were like five bucks and I was really happy, you know, but like, I didn't have to go slog away at an office today. I didn't have to go teach some English lessons. I didn't have to go do anything. You know, I just, I had, I had to take a taxi, which was like 20 bucks and get some pancakes. And... Yeah. But you didn't even give it a second thought. You're like, I want pancakes. You didn't think in your head. Yeah. All right. If I have pancakes then I can't have a Coke and you know what I mean? Yeah. Like once yeah, you don't have to have those thoughts, I would argue that you're rich enough. Yeah, so it could be subjective. Like you know, like if you're living in Vietnam, if you're making two thousand dollars a month U.S. dollars in Vietnam, dude, you're living like a king. You yeah. literally have yeah. house servants. You have a big, nice, modern apartment. Two thousand dollars a month in Tokyo, where I live, not a lot of money. You know, it's it's a big difference. Yeah, or like Rich, for example, he's like, oh, I can't. I have to. If you had, to, if you had to consider, do I buy that R8 or not? He would consider himself poverty. <laughs> But he has to be able to be like, yeah, I'll just go get one and then leave for the weekend. Yeah. And Rolo, I don't know what your level is. I'm assuming for you it's like, I want another Ibanez or something. Well, I got to the point where like I was buying things like when, when I, I I don't want to say I was rich. I don't really consider myself rich right now because I've worked with guys who are like wealthy, super wealthy. I mean, like I've worked for um, the second largest liquor distribution company in the world. I know the the CEO. I know all those guys. I know I know what real wealth is. So like most people's idea of like what oh, if I make like a lot of people they think if they get to six figures that they've made it. Right? I'm talking like wealth that like moves shit like that that mm-hmm. changes lives like like changes businesses like changes politics kind of well and so for me that's like th- there's there's kind of uh, there's there's being rich you know i'm being comfortable and everything else like what do they say like after a certain amount of money like your 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 quality of life doesn't change all that oh money. yeah 75 yeah, that 70, yeah something like that and i got to the point where i was uh i finally got to six figures and i thought what's the big deal like and but then i realized like i was buying stuff that i oh, oh man i've always wanted that guitar i've always wanted this i was and like it, it's like no big deal. In fact, I can have it delivered to my door now, you know, <laughs> just go to, to Amazon or eBay or whatever, and I can have what I want. And I'm like, <clears throat> but I got to, uh, I don't have time. I wish I had more time, right? When you get to a certain point, it's like, I wish I had more leisure time. I wish I had more time to go and, and do these things and, and do that. So I have to like, I'm at a point in life right now where it's like, it's not so much about having stuff. It's about like, what do I want to c- accomplish before I can't accomplish anything anymore? Yeah, like the big difference there, guys, is the difference between uh, being rich and wealthy. Being rich is being able to go out and buy a, a $160,000 R8 in cash. Being wealthy is going out and buying a $5 million LaFerrari and adding it beside a $3 million P1 beside mm-hmm. a one point five million dollar nine eighteen Porsche, like that's like that's wealth, right? Like wealth by big company. big difference. Yes, mm. collecting yeah. companies is what it is. You know? Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. But I would argue at least the bare minimum of wealth. Once you don't have to second guess a purchase you make, especially a small purchase, mm-hmm. then that's at least well enough off that you can stop thinking about money and you start thinking about 
I'd say time because our it seems Rolo that you would gladly pay more if something got you like six hours of your time carved back as opposed to mm -hmm. saving ten thousand dollars on a car but you got to spend all day at the dealership you'd rather spend the ten thousand well i mean you know they always say you know youth is wasted on the young right well it's for me <laughs> like at this point in my life I, I i i wrote about this on my 50th birthday like back to like two years ago and i'm like what do i want to do at this point, I got maybe uh, maybe 30 years, effective 30 years. I talked about this on the, the live time versus dead time show that I did about two weeks ago. And um, that's a concept by Robert Green where he's saying, you know, like like most people, most guys don't have that much live time. Like they're going to cubicle jobs they're sitting in traffic. They're, it's what what Robert Green will call dead time. And mm. it's like you, the time that you have responsibilities or liabilities to do. And so a lot of guys, the more responsibility you take on in life, like you take, if you have a wife, you got kids, you got a job, you've got a kid, you got to make a mortgage, you got to do all this stuff. All that does is it, it incrementally takes more and more time away from you so that maybe you have an hour. Uh, you'd be lucky if you have an hour to yourself on a weeknight to do something that you want to do. And I, again, I talked about this with Hotep last night. He had this really great post that really kind of stuck with me was you are what you 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 are uh, the summation, I guess, of like what you do in your free time and what you what you do in your leisure time. And for a lot of guys, it's drinking, drinking booze. You know, so I yeah. make a lot of money at that, right? Um, it's it's uh, <clears throat> it's playing video games. It's jerking off the porn. It's it's staying on, uh, you know, whatever your site is or whatever your social media is. That just incrementally takes more. It's like it's like killing you with a little tiny knife. You know, like it carves out. Well, there's, there goes an hour. Now you have to go back and do what you were supposed to do when you're dead time. And so when you have that live time, I don't think guys really realize that that's that's at a premium. That's you. You know, they say time is money. Your lifetime is worth more than your dead time. And so what are you going to do with that? And as you get older, you get less and less of that. And I think really the goal at this stage is to find some way to maximize your lifetime. And, and sometimes that means being a selfish prick. Sometimes that means saying, hey, this is what I got to do right now because I want to advance myself. And again, like I'm always a big fan of enlightened self-interest. So what am I going to do with my lifetime? What am I going to do with this, the, the time that I have to build something, to write a book, to build a company, to whatever it is, and, and you know, push everything out to the, the peripheries? No Twitter, no, you know, like, I, you know, you can go to the Jocko Wilnick route, you know, and say, well, we're going to go take cold showers or whatever, but that's, that's your lifetime. What are you going to do with that? Are you going to go into the gym? Good. That's maybe that's something that you want to do and build yourself up. But it's live time versus dead time. And most guys today, I think they have a little bit more leisure time, but the, it, their lifetime, they do nothing with it. It becomes dead time to them because it's time for them to escape their shitty lives. Right. That's oh, that escapism. And that is the that is actually that's a really key point, actually, mm -hmm. because even um, I, I, and look, I, I'm not blowing myself up. I'm I've certainly got a long way to go before I reach Rich's level or anything or anything like that. But nevertheless, you know, having made this break into self-employment out of that space of comfort i mean i was spending a lot of time a lot of my spare time working on myself and working on my projects so weekends evenings before work all of that kind of stuff and that is actually that was actually eating into my like comfort time do you know what i mean like i, I wasn't i've never had netflix i still haven't got netflix do you know what i mean like I, I wasn't sitting around watching these tv shows and stuff like that i would be getting up and grinding um because and for me, it's not necessarily entirely monetary. Um, it's also just the satisfaction of, of doing work that you, you know, you're proud of and you want to put stuff out there. And, um, you know, you, you, you have to be prepared to, to cut away that comfort of, right, I'm just going to sit around this all weekend and watch TV shows or, you know, watch the sport or drink or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Because it, yeah. in service of, of the greater good, which is what you actually want to do. Well, it's more fulfilling. I'll take some time. I got to get these uh, super chats out of the way. First from Vincent to Ryan and Rich. Thanks for giving me the mental mm -hmm. discipline to leave the army. Oh, dude, best decision you ever made. And thanks, Rolo, for ending my distaste of women. I think leaving the <laughs> army might have done that too, though. There's mm -hmm. a lot of like <laughs> military girls. It's like, <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> and then Rumblefish. Thank you again. The $10. Sounds like you guys had a trigger event that got you to a higher level. And through that, you created new mm -hmm. standards and beliefs. Those new standards cut out all the behaviors you kept you complacent. I would argue yes, but here's the thing. I had a lot of them. Yeah, I think everybody mm. gets them. I think the difference is, at least these guys here, and plus a lot of the guys in the chat who are switched on, they actually took those and made a decision from them. 
Yeah. Like, well, I've seen a lot of people like we had like uh, military does this thing where they'll cut a bunch of funding and because the military can't protest, they just take it and they have brain drain. So guys who have something better to do, leave and go do something else. And those who don't just sit there and take it. And I think there's yeah. a lot of guys who would have these exact same stories as we had, but they just kind of take it because either they don't have any better options or they don't think they do. Well, Roosh had a really good article years ago where he, he said something like, how, it was a, how do you make a decision? How do you decide what course of action to take? And his argument was, if, you're, if you've got two things to decide between, and one of them is sort of comfortable and sort of normal, and the other one is challenging and difficult, then tr do the challenging and difficult one. Because kind of what's been said already, either you're going to win big, and even if you don't win, win big, at least you're going to learn something. You're going to gain that life experience from it. So, you know, without the risk of this becoming us all sort of patting ourselves on the back and going, oh, <laughs> look at this stuff we've done. But nevertheless, you know, I think for me, you've got to think, how long am I actually on this planet for? If you're lucky, 80 years, mm -hmm. maybe less than that. You know, we haven't got very much time here. So you've got to think, well, what do I actually want to get out of this experience on this planet? Do I just want to have watched a, a, a ton of Netflix and, and then die eating Cheetos? Or do I want to have tried, at least try to do something else? And what, when you start to look at it in that context, then you can start to apportion your time a bit more uh, profitably. Yeah, and here's my question for you guys. Sorry, John, I'll pass stuff to you next. So obviously you guys make the tough decisions. How many people in your life told you that it was a bad idea? Like military, <laughs> quick example. This is the best job you're ever going to have. You should never leave. It's these guys who joined straight out of high school, like literally scaring you into thinking as soon as you leave, you're taking a pay cut. You're going to be destitute. I'm just curious if you guys had that same. I'm guessing yes from the laugh. What did you say, John? You'll never find a hotter chick yeah. than that. <laughs> was, yeah, yeah, I've heard that one. You're talking yeah. about what? Like going back to what Troy said about like you know Roos choose, saying choose the most difficult path. That's I think that's really true. I think that's why. Ruth is, Roosh is on the path of Christ now because you got to carry that cross daily, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, honestly, I'll tell you this. I now use stupid people as a barometer for ideas because everybody told me like, you know, I said, I'm going to go to Japan. They're like, wow, that's a really bad idea. Like you could never do that. Like it's, it's impossible. And then I said like, yeah, I'm going to quit my job and become a YouTuber and uh and i think i'm gonna do pretty well for myself doing that and they're like oh yeah that's crazy dude you'll never do that and i was like you know i think i'm gonna start a cryptocurrency show and like get really involved in bitcoin and and you know make a bunch of predictions and partner up with a buddy who also quit the same job with me and they're like yeah that, that's pretty that's pretty crazy too and everything has worked out phenomenally um i've met people like big i've met you know the the through my cryptocurrency uh, pursuits, I've met the CEO of Binance. I've met Roger Veer. I've met uh, Vitalik Buterin. I've met Adam uh, Trademan, the president and CEO of Bitwall uh, Bread Wallet. I had John McAfee on my show on the channel uh, a couple weeks ago. Like all these things would never have been possible if I listened to these fucking dummies. And so, yeah, when people tell me it's a bad idea and I look at their life, I'm like, okay, fat, loser, uh, makes less than six figures a year, uh, doesn't take care of himself, jerks off the porn on a regular, solid. Like, I got to do, like, if this guy says it's a bad idea, then I absolutely must do it. Sounds a lot like your little quote, Rich, about would I trade places with that guy. Correct. I was about to say that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, what do you guys so that's think the thing, like, you always want to ask yourself when somebody's offering you advice is, would you trade places with them? Like... This person that is defense that is dispensing said words is is saying don't do this, don't do that because of you know whatever insert reason. Would you would you want to walk you know in their shoes? Would you want to live their life? And if the answer is no, then the advice is garbage. Often um, you know really really smart people look like crazy people to dumb people. Um, they just don't get it. And you know back to the earlier point of how many people said said to you that that won't work pretty much everybody all of like, them <laughs> yeah like you know pretty much everybody said that's not going to work that'll never work you'll never get that off the ground but it's like look if people are giving you money for the value that you're creating then there's something there and you have to figure out if you can find a way to like force multiply that right 
I'd agree. And then Rolo, I'm curious the story behind your chuckle there you had. <laughs> oh man, I, I've had it from so many different people, particularly like when I was in when I was younger, right? Because really, I mean, honestly, if I'm gonna be honest with myself and I try to be as honest as I can these days with myself, like back when I was like in my twenties and I was in my rock star phase. Um, you know, my dad would say like, you, you know, you should really have some other thing going for you besides this, because if it, you know, do what you, he was not really supportive of it, obviously, but like, I, I really didn't give a shit at that point. And so I was out doing this stuff and he would always say like, you know, get into commercial art, get back into college, good, get back into this kind of stuff. And, and, you know, it was always, oh, it's never going to work. It's never going to work. And, and, and it didn't, but I enjoyed my experience while I was doing it for the, you know, four or five years that I was doing it. And then after a while, I kind of had to learn the hard way that, you know, this is what I should, this is maybe this is where my talents really lie. This is really what I ought to be, you know, focusing my time on. Um, and then, you know, a series of events where people were saying, well, you're never going to be a success at this. You're never going to be a success at this. And then there was times where I go, okay, maybe they're right. Maybe I should, you know, do so. Maybe I'm, maybe I am in error. And then, what I've found, and I, I wrote this in my book, is what I've found is that when I made myself my mental point of origin, when I started adopting the ideal of, of uh, enlightened self-interest, I found that I did better in those situations than I did when I was doing what I was supposed to do, like when, what people were telling me to do, whether it was with a relationship with a woman or if it was a, a job or whatever. And I'll tell you, the thing that gets you is once you get into a position where you have liabilities and personal responsibilities, making mm -hmm. that decision gets harder and harder because people are dependent on you. And yeah. so when you say, you know what, um, I'm done being this, my career, and now I want to retrain or now I want to go and do something like this because I really feel like that's where I want to go and I want to do that. Most guys won't make that decision because their wives are telling them, no, you can't do that. Well, what, how will we feed the baby? You know, uh, there's all these things that are piled on you. So you don't make, so you don't get out. So you don't break out. And usually it takes a zeroing out for you to realize, okay, now I, I've got nothing left to lose. So I'm going to go this way. I'm going to do that. And, so, and lo and behold, it works out for you because you are your primary you know, decision maker, you're the primary person in your life at that point, rather than like thinking about like other people or your wife or your kids or whatever before, you know, you have to, I don't think enough guys trust themselves or give themselves permission to make changes for themselves. And so they believe that. And so when I was like, my dad would say like, oh, this isn't going to work. You shouldn't do that. And I tell you, what's funny is I became successful because I didn't listen. I can't. I became successful because I didn't listen to a lot of the people saying, "Well, you shouldn't do that. You should do the responsible thing." It's this old, what's what I called old order thinking. And so you got these guys who think that, like, like my mom, for example, is a really good example. She's old school, so she's like, "Why do you change jobs so much? How come you like even when I was working as an art director and graphic designer and all that stuff, I was changing jobs all the time because that's just what you do. That's the the reality of the economy and where we're at right now. It's yeah. the the gig economy, but." My mom and my dad were from a generation where you go to work, you find a good company, you get a pension, you retire at 65, you go play golf in Florida, and then you die in some assisted living place, right? That's, oh, that sounds that, hot. Yeah, that was the, that's the <laughs> plan, right? And I'm like, no, that's not the plan anymore because that's not a reality anymore. But there's still people who will cling to that. I think what guys need, and I'll end here, is I think what guys need to, to really sort of make a distinction between is when people are giving you advice, is that old order thinking or is that new order thinking? Yeah, exactly. And also, if they care about you, then sometimes they're particularly family members and mothers and things. There's a tendency to be uh, on, on the cautious side. There's a tendency to say, no, don't do that. Surely it will be safer to do this. Surely it will be safe to do that. But they're reflecting their own insecurities when they say that stuff or they mm -hmm. are thinking about what they would do in the situation yeah. and that's not necessarily right for you so one of the things that i've learned or i'm slowly learning um over the years i guess is that you have to um i mean you can you can hear people's opinions but ultimately you have to make your own decision about what you're going to do it's almost like this red pill thing in. is like started with chicks and then it leaves with self-actualization <laughs> uh, yes yes mm -hmm. if i may just chime in here so um, if you guys aren't watching the Playing the Win series on my channel, I, I usually do it every other Thursday, sometimes every Thursday. But um, there's a notion of playing the win versus playing not to lose. So playing the win is the guy that starts up the business and has success at it. That's, you know, that's the entrepreneur cut and dry. The playing not to lose thinking model is 
go and get a secure job that has a good pension with good benefits and time off, like, you know, firefighting, teaching, you know, stuff like that. Um, on last Thursday's episode, so Thursday this week, I had a friend on, Joel Terran, and at the peak of his business, I think he said he was doing something like $80 million a year. And he Damn. told his mom, um, you know, the level of success that he had. And she's always been a plain not to uh, lose sort of mindset thinker, which is generally how women think. Women are more conservative. Um, yeah. They generally play not to lose when it comes to making choices, especially with money. Uh, whereas men need to be the risk takers because we've always been the damn risk takers. So whenever he would, you know, uh, ask for advice from her over the years, she'd always basically say the same thing. Like, well, you know, you have to pay taxes on that or that's quite dangerous. It's like, you know, there's not a lot of celebration. So if you want advice from people when it, when it comes to laying new tracks, then you have to get um, into conversations with guys that are playing to win in their life. And you have to identify between people that play to win and play not to lose. And it's okay for the play not to lose guys to chime in because it's always good to have a sober second thinker in your life. Mm -hmm. um, I've come up with some batshit crazy ideas when I was heavily involved in the debt business and my younger brother, who's my partner, uh, has, has basically, well, not quashed them because I've always made the final decision. But, um, you know, because he's a sober second thinker and he generally plays not to lose, um, he would stop me from making some dumb choices. So listen, but don't always follow what they're saying, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. A really good example of what Rich was just talking about, by the way, is did anyone see this recently? This, this, it was something that was pulled off Reddit. I actually saw it on Reddit and then somebody shared it on Twitter. And it was this woman and she was writing in, I forget which, which subreddit it was, but basically she was saying, my son has said that he wants to leave college and go into YouTube full time. And she said, I'm really worried about this because he's only got 63,000 followers. What kind of career is he going to have? <laughs> He's only got this 63,000 followers on this crazy YouTube thing. Like, you know, surely he should go to college. And people were sharing this around and going, well, this is ridiculous. I mean, 63,000 followers. I mean, that is, you know, the guy's got decent traction already. I mean, really, yeah. really good traction. You could be making decent money off of that, even assuming that he, even if he didn't grow at all. So that's a really good example of what I think most of us on this panel would, or all of us on this panel would, would regard as bad advice from somebody who, you know, sure she cares about him, but she doesn't understand the reality of she the just, opportunity that dude's got. She doesn't got. know what the fuck she's talking about. Dude, you don't need mm. a lot of subscribers or followers. Well, to exactly. Make well, we, we know that. We know that, don't we? But I mean, if you've got, if you've got 63,000, <laughs> Yeah. You're bloody good to go, aren't you? I mean, I'm talking for the audience members who may not yeah. know that. Like, you know, mm. uh, dude, if you have 63,000 followers on YouTube, like, you literally can make a million dollars a year off of that. Mm. It's very, I, very possible. I was talking. You could probably to, do it with 20,000 if you're really yeah. good at it. I was talking to Hotep Jesus about this last night. And it's what I call the, uh, this is in my fourth book. Uh, it's what I call the hustle economy right now. We've moved from the gig yeah. economy to the hustle economy. And that's really, technically, that's what we all do, really. But mm -hmm. um, some people are more grifters than, than others, right? I mean, there's, there's guys who are just sort of the red meat for the red pill kind of guys. And then there's the guys who actually are putting stuff out there because they want to, like, that's their thing. Like, that's, they want to help. They want to do something for it. And I think a lot of people, their heart's in the right place, but they're, their idea of what they're going to do on YouTube or what they're going to do as a sort of a, an influencer, right? Or they're going to, they're going to get into sort of the hustle economy, as I say. Um, but the problem I think is going to happen is this, is that the, that hustle economy is going to get so saturated that only the, the guys who have like the real, like the balls to, st to stick with it are going to be the ones who are going to be the successful ones. Because right now, everybody is doing this and they are seeing the formula and the template to do it. In fact, there's grifters that are grifting the grifters right now. Here's the template to be a successful grifter. I'm a grifter grifting you, right? And, and so I'm a grifter. When, when you see the coming... <laughs> <laughs> but when you see these guys coming up and they're, they're like, I'm a life coach, I'm a cat, like the, the barrier to entry is so low right now that anybody can get into it. That's why a, an account of like 60,000, like I've got, I've got 43,000 subs on my YouTube. I've got 60,000 followers. I'm, you know, and I'm an author. I've got three books out that I had before I started doing YouTube, before I started doing uh, anything else. But I, what I see happening, and I, I said this in the the state of the uh, state of the union, state of the master address that I did back in 2018, is that you see these guys coming in to the hustle economy, and they see it as easy money, and it is now. 
But I think within the next, like, say, two or three years, maybe even four years, all these girls who are getting in on OnlyFans, which I see is also part of the hustle economy, that's getting <laughs> saturated. Um, things are getting easier. The, like I said, the barrier to entry is so low that everybody's getting in and they see it as like easy money. It's certainly better money than working in a cubicle somewhere or flipping burgers or being a sandwich artist or barista or whatever. It seems like a better idea to do that. I'm not going to college. I'm going to be a YouTuber. What are you going to do? Well, you've got to, you've got to, you got to hustle. You got to be a clown. You got to do something. You have to stay on top of that. And I don't think that a lot of the guys who see it as easy money understand what the future commitment to that is going to be. So what happens is you get these guys who quit their day jobs to become, you know, the, the, the pinnacle of a man or the, you know, start their fraternity of whatever. Right. I and, knew that was coming. And they think that <laughs> and so they quit their job and they're, they're probably making probably another 10,000, $20,000 more per year in that job than they were at their, their regular job that they were told was what they should be doing because it's a regular paycheck. Now they're doing this and it's an irregular paycheck and it's dependent on them hustling constantly and i don't think that after i don't think that that's sustainable for certain for certain guys for certain personnel or for certain girls for that matter too for certain personality types sustaining that becomes really really difficult well, and as we go forward it's going to get more and more difficult well you've got to go all in haven't you it's like john said you've got to you've got to go if you're going to do it you've got to be like right i'm going to smash it i'm going to just put out content constantly because that's the only way that you're going to get traction and even then it's not easy but that is the only way that you're going to, I mean, there's the old saying, isn't there? The, 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 the one thing you can control is how hard you work. Yeah, and pretty much. if, you mm -hmm. know, if you like, you can say that anybody, that everybody else, they've got all these different advantages, but I, I know that I can outwork them. And if you can yes. hold good to that, that'll take you a long way. I believe. That's yeah, and I think that's a good answer for this guy's question too. Their the choice plan B is just to do it to the utmost of his ability. And I think that's a great plan B. Uh, basically yeah. that's not a plan B. <laughs> just do it. Worry yeah, about that yeah. later. A, a lot of people like you know that that that's a great X factor in life is, and and I'm glad Troy mentioned that. The amount of effort you give can be the great equalizer. Like honestly, when I started uh, as Rule Zero, I had uh, the least cloud of everybody on this panel, but I fucking did a show, and I still do a show like pretty much every single day, and uh, now I'm like kind of catching up in respects to everybody else on the panel because I've been literally putting in work every single day i'm lit in june i'm live streaming every single day on my show 9 a.m and so yeah that's the thing we we don't live in a scarcity society anymore we live in a post-scarcity society so for all you guys out there who like the guys who typically complain if you have enough time to sit around and complain you're not working hard enough to get what you want period <laughs> You know, like complaining is what women do at like, you know, Sunday lunch when they're like spending, you know, their husband's money slamming mimosas and pancakes at 1130 in the afternoon. You know what I mean? So like um, 1130 you're, morning, if you're at the gym and you're on your cell phone at the gym, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> yeah. I'm switching tracks. I just didn't want to listen to KMFDM for the but like, we, we don't you don't have an excuse anymore. Like in these days, like. There's infinite knowledge on YouTube. There's infinite access. You could set up a PayPal account for free. You could set up a Stripe account for free. You could set up a Bitcoin wallet for free. If you're hearing the words that are coming out of our mouths right now, you have the opportunity to change your life. And if you don't do it, it's on you. Everything that I've uh, learned to do, I, I, the most I've ever paid for was like a $20 book that really changed like my perception on internet marketing. And then other than that, like, you know, I got help from uh, some people with on, on this panel and uh, I was able to change my life. And to this day, I'm still pushing forward, but it doesn't stop. Like, I'm still, you know, I just I started really uh, reading some real estate books recently. And I just learned like I learned the other day in this book, a great book called Tax Free Wealth, talking about how depreciation is one of the best assets you can have on your tax uh, return every year. And I didn't even know about that. So there's always an opportunity and there's always a way to keep growing and moving forward in today's society. So this is why I'm very hard on guys. Like, you know, if you have some kind of mental or emotional trauma you're carrying around and like, you know, the software's messed up up here, I understand. But other than that, like the opportunity is available for everybody. But sitting around whining and it's not yeah. gonna help you. Yeah, sorry man, I was just gonna say that like I'm like I'm glad you're saying that because 
I often get criticized for being too tough on people and not caring or mm. humble or whatever. The, oh, you big softy. They, they don't know use. you. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you're like, shaming everybody. Yeah. Here, like, here's the thing, guys. Uh, 20 years ago, Rolo Tomasi would not exist, right? Like, mm -hmm. you would need a book deal to publish a book. Now you can go and publish your own book. Mm -hmm. um, so things have changed considerably. Like, everybody, like, who, uh, who is it? If PewDiePie that's got the biggest channel, like, we yeah. all press the same upload button that PewDiePie <laughs> presses when he publishes a video or if he live streams. We all, like, there is no gatekeeper to many things anymore. Um, mm. Whereas in the past, you'd need to have a, uh, a manager, you'd have to have a deal with a production company, you'd have to have a contract for so many episodes, blah, blah, blah. Now you can just publish videos if you want straight to YouTube. Um, so whether you're publishing books or videos or, or any kind of information product, those things have like the barrier to empty. Sorry, the barrier to, the barrier to entry has has completely been removed. There is no gatekeeper. It does not exist. I mean, the gatekeeper literally, oops, damn quote. The gatekeeper literally is having a cell phone and a corded microphone, and that's it. And you can publish videos on YouTube, right? And a bucket hat. That's all you need to succeed in life. And a bucket hat. <laughs> and a wife beater. Don't forget the wife beater. Yeah. yeah. All right. So on that note, then, we've been going for a bit. I'm not going to lie to you guys. It is sunny as hell out there. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you noticed this, but because of the Seattle riots, COVID is officially over. So <laughs> I'm going to go around the thing here. Start with Rich. Give us some closing thoughts, and then you guys go out and start banging some hoes or build something. Yeah. Put it in the chat. We should make a hashtag for this, like a rule zero hashtag. Put some comp. Put some shit you've done with rule zero hashtag in it in Twitter. I'd love to hear it. Oh, that'd be Anyways, good. Rich. Good idea. Yeah, get out there in the sun and get some vitamin D and hit the gym and just you know do your thing, man. Like there is no barrier to entry to creating something. And if you're not on my email list, it's entrepreneursandcars.com forward slash red dash flags. Um, make sure you subscribe to my channel, and that's just what's up with me. All right. Oh, me. Uh, I will be on tomorrow. John, are we, we're on tomorrow on my show, right? You're, you're coming on with me. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess so. <laughs> okay. Possibly tomorrow. I will have John <laughs> on with me on my show. That is at 1 PM Pacific, 4 PM Eastern. Uh, I'll let you guys speculate on what we're going to talk about, if uh -huh. I come down. but that, I, I will be doing my show tomorrow at that time, regular time. I just did a show yesterday um, on Hotep Jesus's uh, uh, YouTube channel. Uh, speaking of another guy who, you know, it's interesting is Hotep Jesus has like 185,000 Twitter followers and he's got like 30,000 subs on his YouTube. So that that's interesting to see the balance between those two. Hmm. Um, so uh, that was a really good discussion. I did a two-hour discussion with him yesterday. So if you want to check that out, that was uh, his Friday show. Um, and then uh, what else am I doing? Oh, uh, the closing thoughts. If you, if this is like, if the, what we've been talking about is something that you are either struggling with or you know, getting off the couch kind of thing, um, I, I did a really great uh, show. Uh, I pat myself on my back. Uh, it was it was called A Lifetime versus Dead Time. You can look at that on my channel, and it it goes into a lot more detail about what I was talking about. But if you're looking for some sort of resource, I think the very best resource for this is reading Robert Greene's Mastery, the book Mastery, <clears throat> because it it pretty much reiterates what we've been talking about. Yeah, I co-signed that for you sure. You have never lived in an age where we had more access to more information and more. Uh, opportunity for becoming a master in whatever it is or in multiple things. And uh, it goes through like the process of like sort of you know, finding a, a mentor and, and sort of busting yourself down into this mentality where you have to push yourself forward and you have the access like never before. But it, it, in spite of all of that, we've never been more lazy. We've never been more lethargic. We've never been more purposeless. So I, I just wanted to promote that out there because I really like that book. When guys ask me about this kind of stuff, that's the first thing I say. Fair enough. All right, Troy, now that the UK, it's illegal to have sex. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> it is now legal to have sex, but they have advised that people wear masks while they're doing it. So, um, it's, it's, which is kind of hot when you think about it. Um, yeah. So just uh, follow me on YouTube, check out my YouTube channel, follow me there, subscribe to my channel really helps me to grow the audience. Uh, the main bit of news from me is that my uh, essay and article collection, Renegade Dating Domination, is out on Monday, uh, which is the 15th of June. It's a mammoth thing. It's two volumes. 
Um, this is uh, digital, by the way. It's a digital download, but it's an EPUB and a, a PDF um, of all the best articles that I did in the Return of Kings period, and all of the best articles, some of the best articles also from realtroyfrancis.com as well. So that drops on Monday, but it's available for pre-order now. So if you go to my YouTube channel, you will see the uh, you'll see the, the the link for that. So jump on board with that as well because you get a twenty five percent discount if you buy it in the promotional period. Um, nice. I'll leave it there. <laughs> Sorry. Johnny. Hey, so every day this month on my channel, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, we are having Generals June, where I am interviewing all the generals in the Hot Dude Army that are going to be featured in the upcoming three-week educational seminar starting July 1st in Body Language Mastery. June 25th, Body Language Mastery opens again for five days. You can text MLD to 30500 to get on the waiting list, or you can just go to modernlifedating.com forward slash body language. We're going to continue this conversation about comfort. It's killing men. It's destroying lives and how it's the silent but deadly killer. Me and my man, Myron Gaines, we're going to be on my channel on Dude Party, episode 32. We're talking about why comfort and convenience is the enemy of men. As soon as this broadcast goes dead, we're going to go over to my channel on Go Live. So see you guys there for that conversation. It's going to be a good one. Nice. Okay, I'll end this one off. Thanks, guys, for showing up. Don't forget to hit the like button. Um, it's nice to hear about the bag and groceries and a red pill lens, but I would suggest Dude Party anyways. For me, my book just came out on Kobo, so Fuck Files, 15 Lessons from a Decade of Women. Link down below in the chat for Amazon. Right now, it's on paperback. It's on Kobo. It's on Kindle. The audiobook is coming, but there's a lot of construction going on in the recording studio, so it's a little bit slower going. And then beyond that, I guess I'll, I'll go check out Dude Party. I got nothing else. So cheers, guys. Nice. Let's get some sun. All right. See you guys.